Let's talk about SIBO. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a very common condition, but often gets missed by traditional medicine, not tested for, and not even known about. Why? Because we're not trained to look for it. So what are some of the symptoms of SIBO? Gas, bloating, indigestion, diarrhea, constipation, feeling that big pregnant belly after you eat, or extreme brain fog, or fatigue after you eat. Now, you may even have other symptoms like bad acne or rosacea or having other autoimmune conditions that have been linked to SIBO. Now, what is SIBO? It's an overgrowth of bacteria in the part of your intestines where little to no bacteria should live. In the small intestine, when we have bacterial overgrowth, the food that we eat gets fermented too quickly, and that produces methane and hydrogen gas, which can then cause all the symptoms, including constipation and diarrhea. Now, it causes damage to the lining of the colon, which eventually leads to leaky gut, systemic inflammation, increases the propensity for neurodegenerative diseases, mental illness, and even autoimmune diseases. So why is this important? Because SIBO isn't just about gut health. When you have an overgrowth of bacteria in your small intestine, it prevents the breakdown, the digestion and absorption of nutrients. And so downstream, when you have a deficiency in vitamins, minerals, amino acids, proteins, fats, this can affect every organ in the system. Not only that, but chronic inflammation in the bowel causes the gut lining to become leaky, to become injured. That causes things to pass through into the body that aren't supposed to. That activates the immune system. Then you have chronic, ongoing inflammation in the body. It can activate the immune system to cause autoimmunity. It can cause inflammation in your joints, in your skin, in your brain, leading to neurogenerative diseases, chronic migraines, mood changes, acne, rosacea, thyroid problems, hormone problems, and so much more. So it's so important to identify SIBO. So how do you test for SIBO? Well, if you're seeing your specialist, the gastroenterologist, and they're going to do an endoscopy, they can do a culture or a biopsy in the small intestine. But if that's not available to you, look at a SIBO breath test that you can do at home. Now it's controversial, but it can help us get some more information. And the way the test is done is you do a specific diet the day before, and then the morning of the test, you're fasting. You do a breath baseline test to see if you're producing any hydrogen or methane. Then you drink a very sugary drink, and then every 30 minutes, you breathe again into a tube to collect the gas. The lab will then measure if you're producing any hydrogen or methane within the first two hours of drinking that sugary drink. Now, if you do produce hydrogen and methane at high amounts in that first two hours, you may actually have SIBO. So now let's talk about some of the risk factors for SIBO. Well, in our digestive tract, we have a nervous system. And part of that nervous system is called the migrating motor complex. It's a set of nerves that activates every 90 minutes to do a rinse cycle. It cleans out all the bacteria and food and debris from your digestive tract. If something is wrong with your MMC, that can slow down gut motility, increase your risk for constipation, cause stagnation and pooling of food and fecal material in your small intestine, increasing your risk for SIBO. Also, if you have depression, anxiety, mood disorders, chronic stress, that can affect the nervous system of your bowel, increasing your risk for SIBO by slowing your gut motility. Now, certain medications can slow down motility, acid reducer medications, antibiotics can disrupt your gut health. So other conditions like neurodegenerative diseases can in fact cause SIBO because of those Parkinson's patients or Alzheimer's patients that have slow motility. Certain autoimmune conditions like low thyroid can slow down motility and that can also cause SIBO. So we don't really know if it's the chicken or the egg. Did the SIBO cause the disease or did the disease lead to SIBO? But we know that there is a strong correlate between the two. So the treatment of SIBO can be quite complicated and it is so important that you work with a trained professional because 50% of people with SIBO typically get a recurrence within the first year. So there has to be a comprehensive plan. The first step is removing the overgrowth. This can be done with traditional antibiotics like rifaximin and neomycin or botanical treatments. The second step is replacing nutrients. So this could be vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fats, 
enzymes, bile acids, acid, anything that helps us with digestion. Now, the third step is re-inoculation. You wanna make sure that you're not adding in any probiotics in the first phase of treatment because it can actually make things worse. So there are SIBO-safe probiotics that can be added in later after the overgrowth has been treated. The next step is repairing the gut lining. Oftentimes with prolonged SIBO, people have leaky gut. So you do want to do treatments to help soothe and repair the gut lining with short chain fatty acids. And then you always want to restore the mind, body, spirit with working on the vagus nerve through relaxation exercises, reducing stress, getting into a good routine with sleep and nutrition and healthy food habits and exercise. So if you wanna learn more about SIBO, join me for my next masterclass that's coming up on the first Wednesday of April, where I'll be talking about all things gut health. See you there.